Today's episode includes graphic descriptions of a burn victim's injuries from 9-11. Listener discretion is advised. And I didn't scream out, Jesus, save me, because the, the salvation of this, the spiritual salvation, that was already done. It was, Jesus, I'm coming to see you. It was the recognition that I was past the point of trying to survive, but I'd reached the point of reconciling myself with what, what I knew was my death that day. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, a weekly podcast with unique stories from the kingdom of God told by the people compelled to live for him. In last week's episode, we heard from Jill Robbins, who had an abortion at the age of 17, which was unfortunately only the beginning of a self-destructive lifestyle that she pursued for years. Jill's life was falling apart until she found the only one who could put the pieces back together again. You can hear that episode and more at our website, compelledpodcast.com. Today's episode commemorates the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks on the United States. And while that day was horrific and filled with tragedy, God's hand was still at work. Our guest today is Texas State Senator Brian Birdwell, who was at the Pentagon on 9-11 when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed just yards away from him, instantly engulfing his body in flames. Brian was faced with certain death, but also with complete peace in knowing that his faith was already placed in a savior. His story is raw, true, and filled with miracles. That story coming up right after a word from today's sponsor. A great way to celebrate the anniversary of the Bill of Rights this month is to actually live it out by signing up your family for a constitutional defense training with Rick Green and his family. You'll exercise your First Amendment freedoms of speech and assembly and your Second Amendment right of self-defense. This is your chance to get a -a one-of-a-kind crash course in firearms training and America's founding documents with America's Constitution coach, my friend, Rick Green. You'll spend your evenings learning from Rick about America's founding fathers and the biblical worldview they held and how that perspective is relevant even today. And you'll spend your days out on the range with Rick, his family, and the expert handgun defense instructors of the largest firearms training facility in the world, Front Sight Firearms Training Institute. Hundreds of families have joined Rick and his family on these trips, and they all come home more knowledgeable about liberty and also trained and prepared to defend that liberty and their families. Rick told me that he had his concealed handgun license for 10 years, but never carried his firearm, leaving his family at risk because he wasn't sure about his abilities. But that all changed after his first trip to Front Sight seven years ago. Rick now wants you and your family to experience the same confidence and protection by learning how to defend yourself and your family. Rick and his family take a limited number of guests out to Front Sight once a month to train on the range and learn about America's founding. If you'd like more information on how to attend with Rick, visit his website at rickgreen.com. Whether you've been shooting your whole life or never touched a gun before, this is your chance to learn in a safe and professional environment filled with like-minded people who want to be good citizens and also protect their families. Space is limited, so find out more at rickgreen.com and let them know that Compelled sent you. I've known of Brian's story for some time and briefly met him several years ago, but last week I finally got the chance to sit down and hear his story face to face. And just a heads up, you'll hear Brian give a description about where he was at the time of the crash. It was only a few yards away. We've created a helpful graphic that you can view at our website, compelledpodcast.com, which can help give you a better idea. With that said, here is Brian's story been a believer since 1971 at 10 years of age. Uh, My brother and I, we lived in Stockton, California at the time, had a wonderful uh, uh, stepfather in our life, uh, Patrick Reeves. Um, James Robison was uh, doing a series of uh, evangelistic crusades and and came through Stockton. We'd been, you know, growing up in a uh, Bible-believing home and uh, at uh, the Civic Center in Stockton, California in 1971, my brother and I both uh, recognized the need for the remission of sin. While we may not have used big words like remission, we recognized that we were in a fallen sinful world and we were part of that and that the only way to reconcile to a, a holy God was uh, through the redemption that, that Christ's sacrifice offered. Um, came to the Lord that way. Mel and I met 
um, in uh, uh, 1986, married in 87. Matthew came along in 89, um, lived a, a nice American dream, you know, middle class life, uh, commissioned in the United States Army. You know, Mel and Matt have, have been with them around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the challenges that come with uh, do you make a decision to leave, you know, leave the career, change careers? You know those types of things. Uh, just because you, you're living the Christian faith doesn't, you know, the Lord tells us that uh, uh, the Lord hated me before it hated you, and we yeah. still live in a fallen, sinful world. So there's the challenges that come with uh, with living in that fallen, sinful world. So it wasn't like life was perfect before 1971, but there were so many things to rejoice. Um, I got assigned. I did everything in my power to avoid uh, being assigned to the Pentagon. Uh, being a being a lieutenant colonel may sound like, you know, that's a high rank, but in the Pentagon, that's just a galley slave. Really? And Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, I actually had a slot to, to go be the deputy, uh, uh, the deputy director for logistics at West Point. That, that got re- – I won't bore you with listeners with what all happened, but it was kind of the Lord, you know, like, no, this is where I want you, and my options to go elsewhere were dwindling fast. Um but uh, but just as the Lord had put uh, my stepfather in my life, there's sometimes there's people that are put in your life for the difficulty of it, and there's other people that are modeling uh, the Lord. Yeah. And my first boss in the Pentagon was uh, Colonel Schombach, a great Christian believer. They live out in Colorado Springs now. We're still in touch. My general was General Robert Van Antwerp, just a great godly man that— uh, I mean, if, if you can't be Jesus Christ, he's on that list of five men in your life wow. that a uh, um, good, good person to model since we're not, you know, none of us can be the Lord. Yeah. Uh, but that kind of, of man. On September 11th, 2001, Brian's day began just like any other day. He arrived at the Pentagon early and settled in for a day's work ahead. The morning of September 11th, I was serving as a military aide to the deputy, Jan Minig, who was our, our deputy to General Van Antwerp. Um, Colonel Williams was my tag team military aide uh, for General Van. I was General Miss Minig's aide. We had two secretaries. Cheryl was in the office. Uh, and then Sandy, our uh, uh, staff actions control officer, was there. General or Colonel Williams took General Van Miss Minig over to the Double Tree for the Garrison Commanders Conference that our staff director was hosting, and then Sandy and Cheryl and I settled in for what we expected to be a slow day. And Sandy gets a call from her daughter Sam. But, uh, she lived up in New York City. Hey, Mom, the World Trade Center been hit by a plane, and and we did what you, Paul, and and everybody else around this country are doing. Whether it was, you know, East Coast already at work, West Coast waking up. Uh, you know, TV at work, radio in the car, whatever it may be. Um, we went into Miss Minig's office uh, and I uh, turned on the TV in there. Sandy and Cheryl watched. Uh, you could see the North Tower, the one with the antenna mast burning, huge gaping hole, and uh, beautiful weather. Uh, the smoke's the only thing coming out of the building's the only thing in the sky. And what did you think had happened? Well, the, the newscasts are all saying, you know, what a tragic accident, and that's what you want to believe, but, you know, the, the, the departure and approach patterns into Newark, LaGuardia, or Kennedy, I mean, kind of like what happened in 09 with Captain Sullenberger, and if I've got a catastrophic failure, and so many of our pilots are, are former military folks, if I've got a catastrophic failure, I'm going to put that thing out in the Atlantic or in the Hudson, like, you know, and so there was that little voice in the back of the mind going, you know, I hear what the media is saying, but this doesn't smell right. And that would be that, that suspicion would be confirmed very shortly when we watched Flight 175. Everybody, you know, watching TVs watches that plane crash on live TV at nearly 600 miles an hour. And that would confirm that this was not a normal day in our nation's life. Sandy Sherrill and I knelt down and I, I just led a prayer that, you know, Lord, uh, we love our first responders, but it's going to be you doing the bulk of the life-saving today, recognizing how constricted a, a city that New York is, the difficulty of maneuver in the streets of New York. And oh, by the way, it's the two largest office buildings. I mean, the, the first responders, the, the firemen, certainly the police officers, the, the calamity here, uh, the Lord's divine hand was going to save most of the lives that day. That's not a statement of, of value 
less value of our first responders. It's a statement of the difference between human and sovereign creator. Yeah. There's no thought that we were next, um, but I uh, told Sandy and Cheryl I was going to step out, go to the men's restroom, uh, and I'd be back momentarily, and those are the last words that I would speak to my two coworkers. Went up to the fourth quarter, turned left, went to the men's restroom, which is next to the elevator shaft, came out of the men's restroom, I'm seven or eight steps out, and I'm about to turn right to go back through where the plane makes impact. So I'm 15 to 20 yards straight line distance from where the nose of the aircraft uh, hits the building at 530 miles an hour. And it is by the Lord's grace, Paul, that I sit uh, with you as the only survivor in the E-ring at the crash site. In a few seconds, you'll hear Brian give a description about his location in the Pentagon during the crash. And to be clear, Brian literally walked through the same hallway on his way to the bathroom that the plane would crash through just moments later. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to look at the graphic we've made on our website, compelledpodcast.com, for a clearer understanding. The E-ring is the outermost ring in the Pentagon, so that is the outer ring that it receives the first penetration of the aircraft. The spokes that connect those rings are called the corridors, and so the aircraft crashes very near the immediate intersection of the fourth quarter and the E-ring. For the, As the listeners recall the video of the Pentagon crumbling. As you're looking at from the outside, looking at the Pentagon, on the left side, it shears off cleanly. And on the right side, the collapse point stays somewhat hinged and creates in the lower right-hand corner of the hole in the wall a, uh, a, a debris pile in triangular shape on the lower right-hand side. My window where my office was was the, the fourth window on the second floor to the left of where it had sheared off cleanly. But the window that I was behind when I came out of the men's restroom is still on the second floor. The first, uh, while the window is blown out, the hole where the window is is still intact. It hasn't crumbled. It's burned. It won't crumble. But it is the first window that hasn't crumbled. That's the window I'm about five to seven yards behind. When I stepped out to go to the men's restroom, I walked through what would be the crash site and what would eventually crumble. This was not like one of um, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's action adventure movies, where you you know you see the flame coming, you jump out of the way, you make a, you go through an immediate you know analytical thought process and say this is bad, I got to get out of here. Now, in fact, in Scripture, when it talks about you know in the twinkling of an eye and the sound of the trumpet when the Lord returns. Um, as a kid growing up in Fort Worth, when Carswell Air Force Base used to be a big B fifty two base, and I'd spent you know almost all of my career in the heavy forces units, you know, big tanks, big artillery, you know, those kinds of things. I've been around a lot of loud things in my life, but nothing as loud as hearing the impact of that aircraft. I didn't hear the plane coming, but I mean, the right engine passes to the right of me. I don't know how far to the right of me, not not very far, but as it's coming through the building, um, the plane is actually turning inside out. The kinetic energy of 530 miles an hour, and 80 tons of an aircraft. And with uh, what's remaining in the, in the tanks is a, a little over 3,000 gallons of jet fuel. Um, I am set ablaze and at the peril of my life in that twinkling of an eye. I'm not rendered unconscious. I am tossed around like a rag doll in, inside the hallway and it's immediate light to dark. I am in a hallway fully aware of my surroundings and in charge of my faculties in the next moment I am set ablaze and struggling with what I know is a life-threatening injury. Brian's body was instantly set on fire. He immediately began inhaling aerosolized jet fuel that was over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and his lungs were instantly damaged. But that was the least of his worries. Stop, drop, and roll in this circumstance is an irrelevant. There's no sprinkler system, nothing designed to put out uh, the, the... ignition of that large of a fire in one single location in an office building. Um, There are three pains and emotions that I'll experience in those seconds and minutes that lasted an eternity emotionally. First is the physical pain of the burns. I was burned on 60% of my body with 40% being third degree burns. And um, the second pain and emotion is the one that really defines terrorism. And that's the, the, 
the and, and I'm, I'm, I want to say this with 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 all humility, but with all intensity. The the experience of knowing that you're facing a life threatening injury, and you know you cannot escape the source of that injury, to go from one side of life, this side of life before death, you know, Lord, as He knits us in our mother's womb. He creates every one of us with that zest for living and the and the natural instinct and preservation of life. And in those moments, when you realize that you are facing that life-threatening injury and there's no escaping it, I cross that threshold over that line that says, "Okay, Lord, I got it. This is a horrible, terrible way to be called into eternity." And I didn't scream out, "Jesus, save me!" Because the the salvation of this, the spiritual salvation, that was already done. And I didn't say, scream out, "Save me from this calamity!" It was, "Jesus, I'm coming to see you." It was the recognition that I was past the point of trying to survive, but I'd reached the point of reconciling myself with what what I knew was my death that day, and recognizing that in having given my life to the Lord in 1971. Of where I would spend eternity, crying out to my Lord and Savior, "I'm coming to see you." It was what the military never trains us to do. I quit. I surrendered. I collapsed to the floor, and I waited to die. And the third pain and emotion is the one that、uh, deals with the permanency of death. As I lay there, I'd gone from the calamity and the horror of the struggle to survive. To the peace, and the quiet, and the silence. Even though it wasn't silent in the building, but the silence of laying there, having reconciled myself, knowing that I am at this moment about to have that feeling of the soul departing the body, and apart from the body, join with the Lord and be standing before my Creator in eternity. And I thought about Mel and Matt that morning. And how I had said goodbye to them, and had I known that morning I was walking out to my death,、um, I would have said goodbye with more rigor than the expectation that I'll see you this evening. Yeah. But I lay there, thought about it, that the next time I would see Matt and Mel would be an eternity. Brian knew that he was going to die. But what he didn't know is that God still had other plans. The、uh, there are a number of miracles that occur that allow me to be with you today.、Um, I'll share just a, a, a couple with you. When the Pentagon was originally built, construction groundbreaking was September eleventh, nineteen forty one. Wow! I kid you not. September eleventh. September eleventh, nineteen forty one was when the Pentagon groundbreaking was. When the Pentagon was built, it didn't have a you know. Sprinkler system. It wasn't ADA compliant, so there's all kinds of remodeling going on. So I've got a sprinkler system in there, and when the plane makes penetration and it's and the plane's turning inside out, dismembering the the 59 passengers and crew, not including the that number does not include the, the terrorists with any honor,、uh, and it's also killing 125 of your fellow Americans inside the building. It penetrates three of the five rings. Well, it's pen- as it's doing that, it's breaking all those water pipes. The impact should have killed me.、Uh, the, being tossed across the—I mean—and we're not talking hallway like at school. We're talking—I mean, Pentagon's the world's largest office building, and I was thrown around like a rag doll from that explosion.、Um, well, I'd collapsed under a functioning sprinkler head. I mean, that's still intact, and there was sufficient water pressure behind it to extinguish the flames that are consuming me. I can feel the. The you know something liquid on my my face. I open up my eyes. I'm laying on the 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 floor. Open up my eyes and I can see in the distance. And it's like if you were a ship at sea, and you cannot see the bulb of the lighthouse, but you can see the reflection of the light off the surface of the water. Yeah, the smoke is filling up the the ceiling of the corridor. Many of the lights are out. There are lights on in the distance that weren't damaged with the impact, reflecting、yeah. off the tile floor. The Lord's now given me directional control because I know which way I'm looking. 
Yeah. I use the wall that I've been blown up against to try to work my way down the hallway. And there's still fires burning around me. And I, I use the wall that I've been blown up against as a third and fourth point of contact. So my feet are on the floor. My hands are up against the wall. And I'm shuffling. This is not a stagger. It's not a, it's not a walk. It's not a run. It's a sidestep. Because, look, part of the reason I, I could never get to my feet is because of the the concussion and the vacuum, the damage done to my sense of balance is is shot. I mean, I, you know, yeah. And so using you know stuff to to the the wall to to stand up, shuffle down somewhere between uh, the D and the C ring as I'm coming out of you know the smoke is thick in the ceiling, but I'm moving more toward the light. Uh, I can start to see the damage done to my body. And here's where things can get graphic, Paul. The, um, I am burnt to a crisp. Only the front of my shirt is is still intact because when I collapsed and you know I'm face down, most of my you know fashionable army polyester pants are burned away. The socks above the leather uh, trim of my shoes at the ankle, everything is burnt all the way up i mean there's portions of my pants that are melted to my knees it was frankly a blessing and it was so hot it didn't have a chance to melt to me it just immediately burned away wow um there's portions in the groin that are still there my leather belt is around my waist everything on the back side is gone i've got a burn scar that runs across the top of my shoulders because as i'm laying face down everything on the back side of me is burning away um, my name badge and or my name tag and my access badge are still connected to my shirt, covered in my own scorched blood, but they're shriveled up and melted. Um, and there's chunks hanging off my arms. I can already feel my face swelling, closed, my eyes, you know, it took rock in the Rocky movie, it took, you know, 14, 15 rounds of being pummeled by Apollo Creed, but it took only seconds uh, in a uh, in the uh, inside the hallway, as I am staggering down the hallway, somewhere between the uh, the C B ring area, four men: Bill McKinnon, Roy Wallace, John Davies, and Chuck Knobloch. And Bill McKinnon and I had been classmates at uh, Command and General Staff College, but Bill doesn't recognize me. And in my exhaustion of having covered about uh, twenty. 30 yards in the condition I've described, totally indisposed, uh, scorched either the soot or the actual burning and charring of my flesh. Um, Roy Royce told me what a what a just a ghastly thing to watch me come out of that smoke. In that exhaustion of covering that that distance in that condition, as well as the relief of knowing I'm about to subordinate myself. To my my comrades in arms i collapsed in front of roy roy's like hey we got one out here let's get him as quickly as we can and this is not a place to to wait for medical care to get to me in fact uh, the as part of the renovation of the pentagon there are doors that are uh, across the hallways across the corridors that can contain a fire the fire containment door has already been closed at between the a and the b ring so had Bill, Roy, Chuck, and John not come out into the, the corridor, I would have eventually gotten to the, and, and hoped a fireman got to me. Otherwise, I would have either died of my injuries or wow. or died of smoke inhalation inside the hallway. Because there's no way to, for anybody inside there to open it up, even temporarily. Yeah. Once it's closed, you're locked in. Yeah. Um, I mean, Roy and, and all of them, you know, we've got one here. we got to move. This is, like I said, this is not a place to wait for medical care to get to me. There's fires burning 40, 50 yards away. I'm laying on the floor, face down. Uh, they, uh, they roll me over, touching me is agonizing. They each grab a limb and give that first exertion to pick me up, but I don't come with them. With the burn, it's like when you have a... a uh, paraffin treatment and you put your hand in the hot wax it's clear but then when you take it out eventually solidifies but the wax just comes right off with burns what's happened is is the the moisture in the body has been evaporated so when you grab somebody that's been burned 
What Bill, Roy, Chuck, and John did was just pull chunks of flesh off of me, and I began screaming at them to leave me alone. Oh, my goodness. And then as they're holding me on my side of my torso, balancing me on the floor, Chuck puts his arms underneath my torso, of course, taking on the left side chunks as he does that. So instead of grasping me what the four of them do, when Chuck puts his arms underneath my torso, then he's gripping the hands of the other. So the, the, the four of them are shaking hands with each other with my body weight resting on it rather than them grasping me. Um, I mean, it's just absolutely agonizing. But they're carrying me. They, we go through a B-ring door, the door that they came out. Because um, remember, the plane penetrates through the, the E, D, and the C. The B is left untouched, except for the burning of the roof. But um, they take me into the, through the B ring door into an access way to take me to the A ring, and I'll be taken to uh, the intersection of the fifth and sixth quarter at the A ring. The A ring is the innermost ring of the Pentagon, um, and be given my first medical care from a, a great Air Force uh, a flight surgeon named uh, John Baxter. He takes my shoes off and what's left of the sock underneath the leather, because uh, the leather shoes were functionally you know protecting my feet um and that's the only place he can see a vein um because i mean that's how charred and wow. whether it's my own scorching or the soot because i mean i've got an inhalation injury i mean there's gunk coming out of my lungs i mean i'm breathing in there but i'm not breathing oxygen i'm breathing the aerosolized jet fuel and the so my lungs i mean i'm actually beginning the process of drowning on the inside because the lungs you know, when you get a blister on the outside, you get that water that fills. Well, that's what's happening in your lungs. When your lungs blister, they begin to get that liquid in there. So I'm having trouble breathing slowly, but I'm in the process of drowning even without having been in water. Dr. Baxter puts the morphine in the right foot after he takes his shoes off. Uh, he and Colonel Davitt, one of the nurses that's with him, put an IV in the left foot to get fluids into me. A wonderful lady from the Navy, Natalie Ogletree, uh, comes down to the right-hand side. She's got her Bible in her hands. And this is not a clean casualty evacuation location. This was basically, let's just get people out of the danger area, set them down where we can that's far enough away, but you, we're right next to the staircase coming down from the fifth, fourth, and third floors. The building is, you know, emptying rapidly. There are people jumping over us, you know. I mean, we do chaos well in the military, and that's what's going on here. But um, Natalie will open her Bible. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together, and it's very difficult to, to speak, but we say the Lord's Prayer together, the 23rd Psalm. She'll read the 91st Psalm over me. I am trembling violently because I can't control, uh, I cannot control my, uh, uh, my arms, my legs. Yeah. Um, just the, the, uh, I'm paced on a, a bodyboard. They put me on a, I mean, this, the death inside the Pentagon in the hallway there in the quarter just seemed to last forever. But my medical care and evacuation out of the building seemed to go like, you know, the snap of a the fingers. There's a, an elongated golf cart kind of thing that acts as the ambulances inside the building, how it got to me. And, and I mean, I just, you know, it's the Lord's hand. I get taken out to, to the North parking, eventually get put in the back of a Ford expedition and I'm taken to Georgetown. And here's one of the many miracles. Uh, and I think it's the most, I mean, I've already described some, but I think it's the most salient. Georgetown University Hospital is not the inner city hospital of downtown D.C., but it's over at Georgetown University. You know, the French amb embassies across the street from the emergency room. You've got senators, ju you know, chief justices and, you know, associate justices on the courts. I mean, the, Georgetown is the high-end neighborhood of what what is mostly inner city D.C., um, uh, I am the only uh, casualty taken to Georgetown. In fact, the nurse in the back of the vehicle with me, uh, um, uh, Jill Heisen, was on her two weeks of annual training at the Pentagon as an Air Force reservist, but she normally worked at Georgetown as a radiology uh, tech, and that's the only hospital she knows how to get to. So she's telling, as uh, she's with me with my IV, that she's telling the driver how to get there. That, that's what really nearly killed me, was the ride to Georgetown. The ER at Georgetown was a level three trauma center, which normally isn't as ideal as a level one or level two. However, God had already sent the right care team for Brian right there. We get to Georgetown. The attending physician is Dr. Michael Williams. 
Well, Dr. Williams had spent two years in a trauma fellowship over at the Washington Hospital Center working under the direction of Drs. Marion Jordan and James Jang. Dr. Jordan was the director of the Burn Center. Dr. Jang is chief of research. So from the perspective of all the emergency rooms in the in greater D.C. area, both inside D.C. and in the, in the suburbs in Virginia and Maryland, I've got the third best burn doctor available to me, and that's seminal for, for several reasons, Paul. First, normally in a, in a normal run-of-the-mill day, when you have an emergency, you get into the emergency room, you, there's three things you do. You stabilize airway, breathing, and circulation. Once those are stabilized, you're evacuated to specialized care. But because aircraft are used as the weapon system that day, and you know, like the needle in the haystack, it's not saying here I am. Uh, when the air, when Flight 77 hits the Pentagon, Vice President Cheney, at uh, inside the White House Situation Room, will will direct Transportation Secretary Mineta to shut down all airspace in the United States. And that includes medevac helicopters. The only thing flying is military aircraft. Yeah. So I remain at Georgetown. Well, here's what's so so special. As the only casualty taken to Georgetown, not only do I have that entire emergency room's undivided attention, I've got a doctor that's had two years of working under the direction of Drs. Jordan and Jang, not just on other emergencies, but on critical burns and the like. And he knows what he's got to do with me because wow. I'm not going anywhere. Wow. I am not going to be evacuated for for about uh, from the time of the impact to the time I get to Georgetown. You're talking 937 to somewhere between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I get to Georgetown around 11 um, or a little shy of 11 o'clock. So I'm in Georgetown five, six hours. He begins to do the escharotomies, the debridements, the, the very brutal things that have to be done for a burn survivor to live. The burn injury is not nearly as bad as the medical care uh, to, to cause you to survive it. Wow. Dr. Williams will come to the left side of the bed and he'll look at me and my eyes are nearly closed. I'm just looking through the you know, very thin uh, opening in the, in the eyes uh, from the swelling. And I can see in his eyes the gravity and the seriousness. He comes up to me and he says, Colonel Birdwell, we're going to do the best that we possibly can for you. And I know what he's telling me because in the in in arriving in the emergency room, there was no, uh, you know, Dr. D. Simone's outside with a triage team ready to triage casualties. I'm the first one arrives. D. Simone looks at me and says, "I don't need to triage him. Get him in. He's critical." And they'll stand out there and wait for people that won't come. I get inside. It's a battle drill. There's there's voice commands and intensity, but no chaos. Dr. Williams tells me what I just told you he said. And so I told him I wanted to do two things, and, and breathing and speaking is, is difficult, very labored. First thing I asked to do was I wanted to take the wedding ring off of my finger, and then I wanted the hospital chaplain. Because what in, in, with a burn, whether it's a ring, a bracelet at the, at the wrist, or a necklace at the, at the chest area, if that's the part of the body burned, as the body swells, that jewelry becomes a tourniquet. And you can lose a limb. I mean, it. So you normally jewelry is cut off the burn survivor. But I didn't want the wedding ring destroyed because I had come to the. Even though I'd been thinking about this on the drive over, Paul, the the Lord spared my life inside the building. But the question of life or death that day hadn't been answered yet. I'm getting emotional here, and I. Um. Judith Rogers, one of the OBGYN nurses that had answered the all hands on deck call. With her gloved hand, she reaches for the ring and, and you've got a picture. My hands look like five blackened hot dogs extending from a burnt steak called my palm. And gold melts somewhere between 700 and 800 degrees, but the, the human body melts long before that. And as I have cooled, like that steak you take off the grill, as I've cooled, things have hardened. Judith reaches for the ring, gives it a slight tug. She degloves the, the finger, blood streaming out. I don't recall it hurting, and I don't think it was because of Dr. Baxter's morphine shot. But it's because I'm concentrating on the finality and the death that I'm dying and the dignity of it and making sure that I have the opportunity through the symbolism of that wedding ring to say goodbye to my wife and my son. 
And Judith takes the ring off and hands it to Major Collison. And I told John, I said, give that to Mel and tell them that I loved her. And then the hospital chaplain, Chaplain Cirillo, comes to the right-hand side. And she just leads that prayer that it wasn't a prayer like in 71 when, you know, at the James Robinson crusade, but it was a prayer that, that said, Lord, you know, you are the great physician. You've brought Brian here that if under the care and stewardship of some exceptional physicians with Dr. Williams, Brian survives, we'll salute that flag and we'll move out with that mission of survival. But if in your wisdom you have brought Brian here to be quietly called into eternity under the care and compassion of his fellow Americans, we'll salute that flag too. It was recognizing whose picture is in the chain of command photos, above all else, of who's in charge of my life here and my eternal life in eternity. When that prayer was over with, I looked at Dr. Williams and said, let's get on with it, resting in the comfort of, of knowing where I would spend eternity. And I remember as vividly as I'm sitting here with you, Paul, right now, they put the mask over. I could feel them turn my head back to, to do the intubation. And that's the first of, of, of 39 trips to the operating room to be over a four-year period be put back together. There was still a long road ahead for Brian, which included many life-saving surgeries and reconstructive operations and months and months of recovery in the hospital. From fingertip to armpit, my arms are completely grafted circumferentially around both arms. My eye sockets have been rebuilt. My ears are artificial cartilage with bone skin grafted over it. the neck, the face, uh, the, th- the, the thumbs have been reconstructed. These are my original thumb bones and the, and the flesh around them. But the, the burns to my hands had, had burned away the, the uh, webbing. And so Dr. Jordan had to go in, um, put uh, uh, basically make an incision, pull the thumb bone out, reconstruct the muscle, put a graft over it, and then stick a, a, a screw like a turnbuckle through the thumb into the index palm bone uh, and keep my thumb apart so that the graft would uh, eventually grow and cover the So I have something of an opposing thumb. Um, I've got artificial things in my, my body, uh, Integra, um, uh, uh, act, uh, Acticote, uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, Transite, other things that help the body uh, except, I mean, it's my own flesh being grafted over me uh, later on. I'll have artificial things, cadaver skin, pig skin, used as a temporary covering. But where uh, grafts tend to not take where there's bony areas, uh, and you've got to have something for the, the blood flow to get to the skin. Yeah. Yeah. So the elbows, the fingers, the, the jointed areas are the hardest to cover, and there's some things that help uh, help uh, uh, mitigate those uh, those challenges. Today, Brian is able to enjoy a life that many said he never would. You know, Mel lived her wedding vows magnificently. Um, I could only hope to do as well if the roles had been reversed. Um, our son, Matt, he's 30 now and married. Uh, we have a grandson, Elijah. And just this past Monday, um, the, our granddaughter, uh, Lily, was born. And on Labor Day, actually, she was induced on Labor Day. There, There's some Birdwell humor. Okay. Um, and, you know, the morning of September 11th at 937, I didn't think I'd see that. And I still hope the Lord gives me a whole lot more years to see, you know, Elijah and Lily married and, and uh, you know, Mel and I get to, you know, grow old, do some things, go see the country that we've bled for. Yeah. Um, but if the Lord calls me sooner than that, if he does, then I know that when he does that, I won't want to, won't want to come back. You know, I won't, once you're in eternity, yeah. there's no turning back. The... The back of the book that says 30 plus operations and countless physical therapy sessions later, Brian Birdwell's living proof that God doesn't waste our pain and that our greatest tragedy can also make us stronger. Our byline verse is 1 Peter 5.10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10. Whether it's physical suffering, uh, marital, financial uh, professional in your, in your job, and much of the suffering our nation's going through with with what is clearly a spiritual and cultural battle of, of good and evil. Um, only the Lord can fix the hearts of men. Yeah. I know that, you know, 9-11 happened 18 years ago. 
almost 18 years ago, just a few days short of that right now. Why do you think God preserved your life? Well, the it, there are t- I'll answer the question this way. There are times people that survive, you know, call it survivor's guilt, and that's really not the right word. Uh, it's the survivor's charge um, to tell the story. Look, the, the greatest story is is in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, why he took Cheryl and Sandy and left me is the calling he gave me to, to proclaim his name, proclaim his kingdom. Look, Paul, I'm as sinful for the Lord as everybody else is. Um, but Mel and I would be derelict in our duty of the story and, and grace that the Lord gave us if we didn't share it. And the gospel message is what our, our hurting nation needs to heal and a hurting world needs to hear. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Praise God. Awesome. Well, Senator Birdwell, I am just so grateful and, and thankful that you're willing to share your story. I know it's not a enjoyable activity reliving some of those moments, but I also think it just yeah. points out the power and grace of God yeah. and how powerful Absolutely. he is and just the redemptive nature of that too. Yeah. So th- Absolutely. Th- th- thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Paul. My treat. As we remember the events of 9-11 and those who died, we should also remember that God was there in the midst of the tragedy and any future tragedy yet to come. It's interesting to note that Brian prayed earlier that morning with his co-workers when the Twin Towers were hit, acknowledging that even though first responders were on the ground, God was the one who would do the life-saving that day. And little did he know that moments later, he himself would be relying on God to save his own life. There are numerous miracles in Brian's journey which point to God's hand in his life, more than we could share in this episode, but many of which are recorded in Brian's book, Refined by Fire. Brian gave me a copy of his book at the end of our interview, and I haven't finished reading it yet, but I can already tell you it is incredible. The book is out of print, but used copies are available online. We'll include a link on our website, and we'll also be giving away a copy to one of our listeners this week. So to enter the drawing, visit compelledpodcast.com, pull up this episode, and you'll see the entry form at the bottom of the page. Also on the website, we'll include a few other resources from Brian, including a couple of video testimonials that he's given about his experience. Today, Brian is a Texas state senator and has served his district for almost a decade. You can learn more about Brian and his family at brianbirdwell.net. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Compelled Podcast and on Twitter at Compelled Show. Also, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. It's one of the best ways to help other people find our show. If you'd like to support the work that we're doing with our podcast, then here are a couple of ways you can help out. The first way you can support Compelled is by sharing this episode with your friends. If you know someone who would be encouraged by Brian's story, then send this episode to them and consider sharing it on social media. It really makes a difference and helps spread the word about the show. The second way is to join Compelled as a monthly member starting at $10 a month. As a monthly member of Compelled, you'll receive access to different perks, including behind-the-scenes recordings from our interviews, which is definitely the most popular perk for our members. When I actually sit down and interview guests, the actual recording is around two hours, and there are all kinds of stories and insights that we end up cutting out of the final episode because of time constraints. But if you really enjoyed listening to a guest like Brian today, then you can dive deeper and listen to all of our behind-the-scenes content when you become a monthly member. And at our $15 a month membership level, you'll also be invited to an exclusive monthly live stream. Once a month, you'll be sent a link to an invite-only video feed where you can meet other Compelled listeners, you can meet some of the team members from the podcast, and occasionally, we might even bring on one of our guests from the show to directly answer questions you might have. And for a limited time, monthly members receive a free movie from Christian Cinema, another one of our sponsors. Since 1999, Christian Cinema has provided entertainment that inspires families. Christian Cinema has no monthly fees, and they have the largest selection of Christian and family-friendly movies. You can watch a movie today at ChristianCinema.com and get a free movie by becoming a compelled monthly member at any level. But of course, the biggest benefit of being a monthly member is you're allowing Compelled to continue sharing these important stories. You can become a monthly member today by visiting compelledpodcast.com and clicking the link at the top that says Become a Member. This episode was edited by Zach Fowler. Find him online at zachfowlerimagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost. View his work at siadesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups. Follow Ben on Instagram at ben.billups. Our media assistant is Frank Allegrea. Find him on Twitter at the Frank Allegrea. 
Our music outro is by Ben Jackson and Brian Facchino, and our assistant producer is none other than my wonderful wife, Sarah Hastings. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from next week's episode with Jonathan Pacheco. Jonathan suffered a spinal cord injury at birth, which should have left him dead. But instead, Jonathan has lived his entire life in a wheelchair. He has a powerful testimony of how God brought him to salvation and then carried him through many of life's hardest struggles, not only his disability, but even through leukemia. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and we'll be back with another compelling story next Tuesday. I was a hypocritical youth pastor that would go and do all these things, um, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, and then go home and just be an absolute wretch. All of a sudden, all of a sudden when I'm hearing these words, it's like if I got a heart transplant. It's like if the veil was lifted from my eyes. It was like if all of a sudden I had an understanding as to every single thing that I had ever read in the scriptures. It was like before I was reading the Bible blind, but now I can see everything.